Hi everyone, this is Divya from Quick Mommy Hacks and today we'll speak to Gopika Kapoor uh, who is going to share her, her journey of raising a kid with autism. Thank you so much for coming here to talk about autism. It's really great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here and uh, I'm really excited to speak with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and also, you know, about your book. Basically, I am a writer. Uh, I'm a mom of uh, two 16-year-olds, they're twins. And when my son Veer was three, um, th when the kids were three, he was diagnosed with autism. And this really changed the course of my life because uh, I kind of plunged straight on into therapy and on teaching him and that became my life. Uh, when he was about five and a half, I really felt that I needed to give back in some way because I was very conscious of the fact that I was very... We were very privileged as far as he was concerned in terms of being able to have the finances, being able to afford therapy, having access to the best doctors. And so I started working at the organization where he was diagnosed. It's called Umi Child Development Center. And I realized that the work that the therapists were doing was the work that I was doing with him. And uh, so I asked to train as a therapist. There was no kind of program at that point of time in India to really train to work with children with autism. And so I trained at Umid and the rest, as they say, is history. So I worked there for 10 years. I worked with a whole bunch of kids, must be about 400, 500 children and their families. Each one taught me so much. And then what happened was that I realized that after all that, I had been living my own journey of acceptance and coming to terms with Veer's diagnosis. And I realized that I was in a very unique position where I was not only a professional with all these years of experience behind me, but I also was in the position of being a parent. So when a parent said that I feel like this, or this is what is happening in my home, I could really put myself in their shoes and understand what it is that they were going through. And um, so I realized that I would have to go back to what I know best, which is writing and write about it because um, there is no book that has been written by an Indian parent. It is something which in our country is considered uh, such a stigma that very few parents will come out and talk about it openly. And uh, I really felt that having a book like this would help a lot of parents. I wished that when I was... In, in my early stages of the journey, that there had been, existed a book like that because the only books that existed were from an American or UK perspective. And so yeah. it was very hard for me to relate to a lot of the things that, was, that were written over there. But I felt that if an Indian parent were to write a book like that, how helpful it would have been for me at, mm -hmm. when I was starting out. And so that's how Beyond the Blue was born. And that's how it's, it all came about. You mentioned briefly also about your motivation behind being the autism consultant as well. So can you tell a little bit about that experience, like your interaction with different kids and so on? It was actually amazing. You know, uh, I started out, as, when I worked at Umid, I worked in fundraising, which I was very, very bad at because I could not ask people for money. It was something which I really, really was very bad at. But I would look at the therapists at work and I would say, okay, you know, 50% of what they're doing is stuff which I'm doing at home with Veer. And I'm sure this is something I can learn. Uh, so I approached Dr. Vipha Krishnamurti, who runs Umid, and she was, uh, to give her full credit, she's agreed. Later on, she told me she was, she didn't know what she was getting into but uh, she said okay you were so enthusiastic about joining the team so I thought all right maybe this will work out uh, that started an amazing journey we had an, a fabulous mentor called Dolores Sheelan she's based out of Portland in Oregon and she and her late husband Bob used to come every year to Umid and she would spend four months training us in autism intervention she's somebody who has over 40 or 50 years of experience in the field and I learned so much from her so it started with very baby steps where I was working with kids um, didn't quite know what I was doing but I knew that I what my intentions were good and slowly slowly I started to see a change in the children I was working with I started to see a change in the families that I was working with and that was the biggest high of all because when you have the uh, ability to impact a child's life and a family's life and help them slowly 
come out of that whole darkness that they're in and start seeing little bits of light it's really a wonderful feeling um mm-hmm. so that went on for 10 years and it was a really amazing amazing uh, journey currently what i do is again i'm not working with kids but i consult with parents because mm-hmm. a lot of parents tell me that you know we've asked our therapist questions we've asked our uh developmental pediatricians questions are occupational therapists but there are some questions which we can only ask a parent because maybe they feel it's too silly or they feel like it, it's too much in the future maybe they feel it's something which they cannot bring up with their doctor they feel sh- hesitant and unsure and then they'll come and ask me these questions so i work as a consultant now of course it's all on zoom but i work with a, as a consultant with parents so that they can come and talk to me about whatever it is that they are feeling about how to choose right school what will happen to my child when they grow up uh, mm-hmm. are they going to start speaking things like that which sometimes they are very hesitant to ask uh, doctors and therapists as well so that's mm-hmm. that's been the full sum of my journey can you elaborate a little bit you know how your experience was in terms of uh, noticing the signs of autism and also sure. finding it uh, finding out about it so veer was always a little different from gayatri you know he was much more reserved he spoke later he uh, would not look us in the eye that is something which a lot of parents do do report first uh, he would prefer to play alone she was at the center of activity and you know had this whole bunch of kids around her and when you have twins it's very easy to see the difference because they're exactly the same age uh so when people would tell me that you know he has a hearing problem or something because he wouldn't respond to his name as well i would get very defensive and very angry but i think be- the reason behind that was there was a tremendous fear that there was something that was different about him um so uh, what happened was that uh, at that time this movie called tare zameen par had come out and mm-hmm. there was a lot of talk of dyslexia and so as i read about that i realized that a lot of the symptoms that uh, were written about were things that veer was showing and so i knew then that i would have to find out what was happening and it was better that i knew rather than lived in this fear of and not no of not knowing um mm-hmm. so of course then we took him for his diagnosis it was very very difficult it was uh, extremely hard to face up to the fact that we had a child uh, who had autism he was the same child as he was the day before his diagnosis but now he had that additional label it was very hard to reconcile the fact that i was now a special needs mom mm-hmm. and uh, it took me a long time to kind of come to terms with that but we uh started working almost immediately with him we started you know therapies with him we started i started reading up a lot and working with him and we really saw a lot of changes and that really made me understand that all children with autism can be taught uh it's just trying mm-hmm. to figure out how how to mm-hmm. teach them and they all can learn and they all can have amazing lives as well So I wanted to talk a little bit about your book as well. So you mentioned in your book about the different stages of diagnosis and uh, you know stage of grief and stage of acceptance as well. So can you tell a little bit about that you know with respect to your experience? So you know these stages of grief this um, that are mentioned by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her book on death and dying are basically uh, starting with denial um Uh, so there's denial there's anger there's sadness there's bargaining and finally you reach a stage of acceptance uh it's not like it it's nicely boxed into different different stages where okay now you're done with denial now let's move on to the next stage it just kind of blurs in of uh, you know one after the other and uh, of course the first thing that that happened with me was uh, when i when the initial diagnosis happened and at that time we were told that it could be asperger syndrome this is something which a lot of people can think of as genius syndrome so mm-hmm. i clung on to that label with all my might you know thinking that okay you know he doesn't have autism he's got asperger syndrome of course now it's all the same uh, same thing um i did a lot of uh, you know tried to figure out a lot of ways in which to help him did a lot of alternative kind of therapies whether it was a, a gluten free case and free diet taking him to a faith healer um, you know trying to figure out different kinds of things doing trying even uh, uh, past life regression therapy to see if there yes. was something you know everything that you try to do to kind of fix your yeah. child uh, i tried that 
uh then uh, there was a lot of anger within me okay because i think i was just so angry at the whole world at life at him at my husband i mean everybody everybody surrounding me uh there was a lot of anger so uh went through a lot of time where i was very bitter and very very angry um you know at at just everybody and it almost seemed like everybody in my path was getting burnt with this anger um yeah. and and of course there was a time when again and all this was happening simultaneously you know where i would be taking him to one therapy after the other we would uh, be, be running here there i would be trying to figure out how to work with him trying to at the same time give time to my daughter making sure she is not mm-hmm. left out and at the end of it i would just be exhausted and feeling so dejected and so hopeless and helpless about the whole thing because we you see the thing is that while uh kids with autism make progress it's not like the case with a typical child there are baby steps mm-hmm. and these yes. steps happen very slowly so you can't from one week to the other it's not like you're going to see progress yes of course yes. it will happen over a period of time but that feeling of dejection and of just the whole wondering of what the point was behind everything that i was doing mm-hmm. uh was so overwhelming it was almost like a depression which happened um all these feelings came and went and it was a lot of things that helped me along the way until i reached a stage of acceptance um i must say that this acceptance continued right up to the point when i wrote beyond the blue mm-hmm. because i think it was in the right the process of writing the book and the process of recalling and putting into words everything that we had gone through for the past how many ever years that i really could appreciate and truly truly accept who my mm-hmm. son was and mm-hmm. i think um i mean i i say i say this to my friends and my family that i think i've fallen more in love with him uh in the in the process of writing the book because i realized how brave he has been i mean he's really lived up mm-hmm. to his name veer and he's um he's he's really come such a long way mm-hmm. and uh i think that writing of the book really helped me to reach that true stage of acceptance and to really feel that extreme acceptance of who he was exactly the way he is right now yeah. when you're consulting with parents uh, you know in your experience what have you seen like you know how does it impact them mentally and emotionally in your experience like when you've uh, interacted with other parents it's very hard you know it's really really hard and um, sometimes when they're talking to me and uh, there's still so much denial going on you know a lot of them don't even uh, a, a lot of them will say you know the doctor says it's autism but i don't think so because uh, my child does x y z and mm-hmm. i i'm i'm almost like nodding with sympathy because i can see that there is that that extreme denial happening initially um and and so i think what what happens is that as a therapist you realize that you need to be very patient you know because every family has their own journey and everybody every family has their own circumstances uh, i was very fortunate because like i said i not only had the uh, monetary means to be able to th- pay for therapy i also had a very very supportive family who was just there for me uh mm-hmm. and that i think really helped me to be able to uh, come out of the closet so to speak to talk to everybody about it and to be able to assume this role uh, that i am assuming now where i can get up and talk about autism in public fora mm-hmm. um there that is not the case with everyone and so i think just uh, realizing that everybody has their own journey and uh, that family different families take different take yeah. their own path and they take mm-hmm. they, they take different uh, different uh, you know they they take their own time i mean somebody might be able to accept it very easily and say okay now mm-hmm. let's get to work and let's try and just see what we can do um mm-hmm. other people take a long long time and mm-hmm. uh, everybody's challenges are different everybody's uh, scenarios are different and so i think uh, just that the parents should be given that time and um in a way it's it's very strange because uh it's um uh it's it the 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 term that is used uh for the process of accepting a child's diagnosis of yeah. autism is called a uh, misguided grief uh 
because mm. parents of children of uh, parents who have lost a child might say what are you talking about why why would why would you grieve over the, this yeah. diagnosis you still have a living mm-hmm. child right mm-hmm. uh, but for a, for a parent it's almost like the child that they had hopes for that they had dreams for has died uh, they are now looking at a different life which is yeah. very different from the one that they dreamt of and hoped for so it mm-hmm. is like a part of their dreams and hopes and the child that they hoped to have has died um yeah. and and so it's really acknowledging that is very important and uh the my hope with beyond the blue is that parents will read it and realize that yes it's a different life but it does not have to be a bad life awareness i would say that in terms of the awareness that was there uh, when veer was diagnosed uh, 13 years ago and uh, the awareness that is there now yes there is a lot more awareness now mm-hmm. is there enough awareness no not at all in a lot more needs to be done um in terms of getting uh, children tested and in terms of getting uh, uh, them assessed again what happens is that a lot of kids come to pediatricians yes. pediatrician have told me that uh, developmental disabilities and specifically autism is about this much in their pediatric Uh, books there's there's literally this much on a page it's probably a couple of paragraphs uh, in their textbooks that is devoted to autism and so they really don't know so those pediatricians who have you know trained themselves who have done workshops umid where i used to work did specific training programs for pediatricians which they used to run where they talked about developmental disabilities so just so that these pediatricians can come to know about them mm-hmm. um but again a lot of pediatricians don't know also there is this whole myth in india about how boys speak later than girls and yeah. so typically when a parent will come and and we know that the ratio of boys to girls uh, who have autism is 4 is to 1 uh, mm-hmm. for boys to one girl and so if a parent comes to a pediatrician with their son and says look my son is not speaking as much or is not meeting his milestones or whatever it is they'll probably say oh you know what it's a boy leave it it doesn't matter he'll speak it's all right uh, but that is why it is really important to go to a developmental pediatrician now the problem again is that while the awareness may be growing the number of developmental pediatricians the number of organizations in india are not that many so while we do have organizations in the metro cities and maybe some of the tier 2 two towns which are mm-hmm. bigger uh, there aren't that many all across india and mm-hmm. yes that i have seen in the time that i have worked that there are organizations that are coming up in in you know remote places and that fabulous thing i mean i think it's a really really great thing that there is a lot more awareness happening it's just not enough yeah uh mm-hmm. which is why again to get a child tested sometimes yes of course they should get tested and they should get a diagnosis but the earlier the better because as you yourself know early intervention works um you know the whole concept of neuroplasticity of the brain where the brain is really absorbing as much as it can or uh, very early is a fabulous thing but again how do parents then get access to that care if they live in a small mm-hmm. little village somewhere or a small town somewhere? you know so mm-hmm. uh, there are all those factors that come into play yeah what have you experienced uh, you know with regards to stigma around autism there's a lot of stigma there's a really a lot of stigma uh, a lot of families who will uh, still believe in a lot of superstitions a lot of families who tend to blame the uh, the mother and say that it is because of her that uh, or something that she did in her pregnancy that caused the autism um i know a lot of families who have children who are grown up and will still not tell their friends their families their neighbors that they they have a child on the spectrum they will still not reveal the diagnosis even though this child is very obviously autistic flapping doing things which children with autism do and that's okay i mean there's nothing wrong with what they are doing they are being themselves it's people mm-hmm. around if they don't know they are obviously going to look at this child and wonder but because of the stigma a lot of people don't reveal the diagnosis um 
again that that is the other need for awareness and acceptance because once people know i think most of them are very accepting um mm-hmm. we have this horrible thing in india where people who are different or children who are different anybody who is different and who has any sort of developmental disability or has any sort of condition which is different is called mad right there's that standard label for it pagal or mad mm-hmm. uh, and so t- what tends to happen is that these children just get labeled mad whereas they are not actually mad they have a condition which sets them apart mm-hmm. from other people that doesn't make mm-hmm. them any any less than the other people it just makes them different but uh, i think because of the stigma a lot of people don't want to speak out which is why i think it's very mm-hmm. very essential that people do speak mm-hmm. out it's also another reason why i am translating my book into hindi and hopefully mm-hmm. into other indian languages because i think if people are able to access it and able to say that look here is this woman who went through this journey here is this family who dealt with it and it's okay maybe they will be able to realize that you know it's all right to have a child with autism and it's all right to be able to live this life and and be able to talk about it uh, because otherwise if we don't start a conversation and we don't keep a conversation going and keeping it relevant uh, there's really no point in in yeah. it kind of you know um in or it will be very difficult to kind of remove this stigma so there are baby steps being taken but it's i mean it's it's uh, they are really yeah. very very small baby steps i also wanted to ask you about the kind of challenges uh, you think an autistic child may face you know while growing up as we know uh, the characteristics of autism are uh, difficulties with social communication and social interaction and uh, again restricted interests and repetitive behaviors as well as some sensory differences in the way they perceive the world uh, so again if you there is a very famous saying which goes that if you met one child on the spectrum you met one child on the spectrum which means basically autism presents itself very differently for different individuals yeah. um mm-hmm. so while you may have one child who is uh, able to to read is able to uh, pontificate on uh, you know thermodynamics uh, and is able to uh, have have long conversations on science and neutrons and physics uh, they may find it very difficult to be able to ask for a glass of water or be able to to have uh, you know a, a little bit of conversation when they go to a birthday party uh, another child may not be able to speak uh, maybe using an uh, an alternative communication device um, but again and and maybe uh, that child will have issues when they go to a birthday party because balloons will be bursting or a pressure cooker will be bursting or the, the light is too much for them yeah. and they can't deal with that or uh, you may have a child who's very academically gifted but will have no friends in school or uh, you may have a child mm-hmm. who's again cognitively impacted and may not be able to do a lot of things in cognitively because that is the part of their autism so that that is what is impacted uh you may have another child who is uh, who wants to play only with bits of string and who if their routine is disturbed even slightly has huge meltdowns because that is they find it very difficult to transition from one thing to the other and that is becomes difficult for them there are other children who find it difficult to eat certain kinds of foods who find it difficult to sleep so autism presents yeah. itself very very differently in mm-hmm. different children and different individuals and how it impacts them would depend on that but it does impact their social kind of yeah. uh, behavior it impacts the way they perceive the world it impacts the way they interact with other people and whether you uh, the somebody on the uh, on the autism spectrum has autism and intellectual disability where their cognitive abilities are impacted or falls into this genius category these uh, these kind of aspects of their life will be impacted mm-hmm. whichever way they they fall uh, so mm-hmm. that's really how it kind of impacts different people on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Uh the next thing that I wanted to ask you was about you know if you could actually describe your routine and the kind of steps that you're taking now with Veer on the daily basis. So for the past year we've had online school and um it's been touch wood it's been a 
fairly easy transition for him uh, unlike uh, a lot of kids who i know who've had a very very hard time in the lockdown um veer is fortunately a child who i have uh, always changed a lot of things around because i learned very early on that kids with autism make patterns and they stick to those patterns and so i knew that if he had to survive in the world i would have to teach him to be flexible so right from the time he was a kid i would make little changes whether it was changing the the place he sat at at the dining table whether it was changing the mat he was eating on whether it was changing the toothpaste that he brushed with whatever it was i kept making sure that we kept changing things around so that he was able to be flexible with it and uh, so after all these years of training fortunately he's a lot more adaptable and he's able to adapt mm -hmm. to different situations um so he's been doing online schooling for a year uh, before we started online schooling actually he was uh started baking with me because we didn't have that much to do during the lockdown so i said okay why don't we start baking and to my surprise and delight he took to it very well and mm -hmm. today i can just write out a recipe for him and he does it entirely by himself so mm -hmm. we in fact started a little business for him uh during the lockdown the first lockdown where uh he was selling his uh, his cakes and he was making a lot of money in fact <laughs> and um this has actually emerged as a great uh, vocation for us to think about as well what is the best way to choose a school for right. uh, you know yes yeah. dilemma as well because uh in india as you know it's, it's very hard to find a school that is very inclusive uh we have a, the right to education which uh, does necessitate that all kids um uh, Uh, till the age of 14 are in a school but mm -hmm. very few schools are truly inclusive in spirit and uh, so the the dilemma that a lot of parents face is whether the, to send a child to a mainstream school or whether to yeah. send a child to a special school i went through that myself and veer was in a mainstream school till grade 1 and then we found that not only was he not able to cope with the academics which is actually really very high uh, i was talking to a patient's parents the other day and they said that he was learning how to the different parts of the brain the brain stem the cerebellum and things like that which for a first grade kid is extremely extremely high to learn these different things so not only was we not coping academically but uh, he was also slowly becoming uh, he was not being included amongst the other kids he would not be invited to birthday parties and i knew very clearly that that is not what i wanted for him mm -hmm. when it comes to choosing a school i really believe that what is very important is one that your child is learning something of value and mm -hmm. secondly that they are happy mm -hmm. and i think both things are equally important i think the child being happy is probably takes slightly more importance for me mm -hmm. um and so while uh, we in his previous school the was very happy going to school i knew that over time he would start being excluded more and more as kids grow uh, yeah. it, it the differences start coming out more acutely and i knew that he would start that that exclusion would happen more and more And mm -hmm. so that's when I pulled him out, and I sent him to a special school. And he's been in a special school since grade two. We did move when about six years ago, and I think it was a very mm. good decision that we moved uh, because he did go into a more structured environment where he had more academic. Um, uh, you know, there was more expected out of him academically, and he really rose to the challenge. But at the same time, he grew a lot. and mm -hmm. uh, he so so now he's really happy in school. He's very happy. I think for parents. to really think about these two things is my child happy and is um, are, are they learning something which is of value which is going to help them get to a particular to meet a particular mm -hmm. goal is the two other two questions they should ask themselves and if they find that they are happy in a particular school and that they are meeting those goals um and are able to learn something of course there will be supplemental learning i think no parent can not teach their child at home there has to be that supplemental learning happening at home but if these two questions are answered then i think mm -hmm. it's a good school for them to go to so you know in your experience what kind of changes would you like to see in the community in terms of resources and in terms of awareness you know in the society so many changes uh 
lot more acceptance, lot more inclusion. I think if we can accept and include uh, people who are on the spectrum, I would say anybody with any kind of difference, you know, anybody with any kind of condition that is different from others. I think once we learn to become more inclusive, opportunities will automatically be created, whether it is in school, whether it is in jobs, whether it is in society, wherever it is uh, for people who are different from others and who mm -hmm. have conditions that are different from others. And I think it all boils down to acceptance and inclusion. Acceptance because we just need to accept them as part of society and we need to include them. It is ensuring the participation at every level of every mm -hmm. individual in society, no matter what their differences are. I think if yeah. we can achieve that, that would be a wonderful thing. Lastly, my last question actually is what is your advice like for the parents who might be in the similar situation and for other parents also, so, you know, just in general, uh, any advice that you have? Yeah, um, I would say something that uh, Dr. Vipa Krishnamurti, who is my developmental pediatrician and my guide and my friend had told me when Veer was first diagnosed. It is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah. And it is going to go on for the rest of your life. You have to run this marathon for a long time and you cannot run it without reserves. So you need to be able to fill up your, yourself with whatever it takes to be able to run that marathon. You need to be able to take care of yourself. And mm -hmm. you really need to, um, to find things that will keep you going. Because it is not, if you, I, I did this myself, I um, literally burnt myself out. And it is not a nice place to be in because, um, you know, you feel such anxiety, you're tired all the time, you're irritable all the time, you're angry all the time, and ultimately it comes out on your child. And it, you're not doing anybody any favors by being a martyr and not taking care of yourself. So please, please, please take care of yourself and do anything that makes you. Uh, happy, do anything that sustains you to so that you are able to complete that marathon and keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're doing an amazing work and especially, you know, through your book and uh, through, you know, your consulting with parents, it's really great. And I hope uh, this video reaches a lot of people and, you know, spreads the awareness around autism. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks a yeah, lot. Thank you. Well, this brings me to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Quick Mommy Hacks, and follow me on Instagram.